上的各位观众朋友们，大家早上好。Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CDTN Rising Star Cities. 欢迎各位来到 CDTN 打造的旗舰融媒体节目 Rising Star Cities， 万亿城市的万亿大讲堂。本次呢，我们是泉州站的万亿大讲堂。我们每到一座城市，都会邀请一位重量级的嘉宾来为我们解码这一座城市的经济发展的秘密，同时呢，也为我们指引未来发展的趋势。那么，我们都知道，泉州呢，在二零二二年上半年 GDP 的增速是百分之二点五，和全国 GDP 的增速是持平。同时呢，在二零二一年的年末，泉州在全国 GDP 的排名呢，从第二十三名上升至第十八名。而民营经济体一直都是泉州经济发展的主力军，泉州已经有了九个千万级产业集群，一百五十九件中国驰名商标，一千零四十八件国际注册商标。Amongst all the cities in the world, and Quanzhou already has nine industries with a production value of more than 100 billion RMB. It also has hundreds of trademarks. Recognized all around the world. So the expert today we have is Mr. Liu Yingkui, Vice President of CCPIT, and Mr. Li is a consulting expert to the uh, National Commission of uh, Reform and Commission uh, and Development, as well as China's Ministry of uh, Commerce. 接下来，让我们掌声欢迎中国贸易会研究院院长刘英奎先生，欢迎。So、today, Mr. Liu will give us an insight about how the city of Chengdu develops, and he will also point the direction forward for this city. Now, without further ado, let's put our hands up for Mr. Liu Yingkui, Vice President of CCPIT. Dear leaders from the CGTN and leaders from the Chengdu Municipal Government, distinguished guests, dear audience watching online, good morning. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you my observation about the high-quality development of Chengdu. So today, I will focus on the innovative and open development and high-quality growth of Quanzhou. First, what is quality development? There are many different standards. My understanding is that first, you need to have a high-end industrial structure which features high added value. And from another perspective, there are different definitions the industry should be concentrating, they should be focusing on high brands as well as green development. And also, the brands should be connected both locally and domestically as well as globally. And we have to well aligned with the supply chain and production chain in China as well as in the whole world. Are we at the low end or are we at the premium end? All the different industries must be connected. So we also need to strike for internationalized development of our different uh, sectors. The third very important one for high-quality development is green development. Are we involved in the international market? Are we featuring a lot of cross-border cooperation? Uh, how much asset do we have overseas? How many employees do we have from overseas? So in China, right now, the 
multinational parameter for Chinese enterprise is, is roughly 15 percent. But those two uh, multinational companies, they have a ratio at 60 percent. So this means we still have a large gap to fill. And also, there is this parameter of uh, business environment. Business environment is crucial to the high quality growth of a city's economy. And there are three uh, parameters for business environment rule of law, market oriented development, and international development. If you have good performance in all categories, then it shows your business environment is very sound. So now let's take a deep dive into all those parameters. So what are the pathways towards high quality development? And there are many different pathways and different approaches. And based on my research and observation, I believe there are at least three. The first is to pay attention to high quality and innovation driven development. In Quanzhou, I can tell you we are doing extremely good in this category. But does this mean that we can be complacent? No, we can never stop our steps forward. We have to constantly transition towards the higher end. And also we have to transition from the traditional manufacturing and processing industry to the high end, for example, new materials, research and development, new techniques, new equipments, and new application scenarios so that we can dramatically improve and upgrade our industrial structure. Also, we have to judge a city's high level of development by the intensity of research and development investment how much money is put into R&D, and there are a lot of standards across the world. And Quanzhou is investing 25 percent of GDP each year in research and development. This is a very pleasant uh, figure. So no matter it is at the government or at the enterprises, there are more and more research centers. And some of the large enterprises, they are accommodating uh, national key laboratories, and this is a very satisfactory news. I give you one example here, which is the Jinjiang uh, uh, Sportswear Company. So this company is producing clothing, swimming suits, and yoga suits. So uh, per unit of uh, product is selling at a very good price. Uh, take the yoga suit, for example. Each piece is costing 1,000 yuan because it's featuring very good fabric. And it, uh, when you put on the yoga suit, uh, your body figure looks uh, very beautiful. Uh, so this company is uh, championing a uh, health and fitness industry. Another very important pathway, pathway is to develop the digital economy. And there are a number of slogans proposed at the government level. For example, uh, smart manufacturing and autonomous production line. Uh, a couple of days ago, I paid a visit to Jiangsu, and we went to some of the representative enterprises in Jiangsu, and we were very impressed. In the factory, you could see no people, no human beings. But the company is featuring a production value of tens of billions of RMB each year. So they are having smart factories. There are uh, mechanic arms, uh, smart robots, and unmanned delivery vehicles inside the factory plants. Why they are using that? Because those machineries, they can improve the efficiency by tens and maybe dozens of folds. Uh, traditional industries feature a labor-intensive landscape. But if we could replace labor with uh, machinery, we can reduce the cost by at least 10 percent. 
So we cannot win the competition if we continue relying heavily on human labor. Then how could we compete with、uh, Laos and Vietnam? Because the average、uh, monthly salary is only 50 percent of that of China. So we have to embrace the development journey of going smart and digital development. For example, if we use a human being as a laborer, each and every year we are paying the person 100,000 yuan. And bearing in mind that there is vacations, there is、uh, sick leaves, but if we use robot, there is no such problem. The robots they don't they don't need a break. They don't need to、uh, stop and rest, and they only cost 200,000 yuan.、Uh, Each robot. So this, I believe, is very important for a city's high-quality development. No matter it's、uh, Jinjiang or Quanzhou, there are some advantages in seeking high-quality development. There are greater potentials to tap if you look at the experience. We have already accumulated. The Jinjiang experience was a concept proposed by General Secretary Xi, and General Secretary Xi has paid a visit to Jinjiang for six times, and this is quite unique. Do you remember that at Chairman Mao's era? Agriculture should learn from the experience of Da Zhai, and、uh, industry should learn from the experience of、uh, Da Zhai and、uh, Da Qing. So we have to tap the potential of the Jinjiang experience and see how that can be applied to the development of our own city. And we also need to integrate experience here domestically and at the global level. So this is very important, and there is a lot of potential that we can tap. To give you another example, at the SCO meeting, President Xi Jinping said we need to build a international cooperation zone for medical cooperation, and the site is selected at Fangchenggang. So this is a very important opportunity. So the local government acted up on this idea immediately. And then it submitted this、uh, plan to the、uh, NDRC, and then the NDRC said, "Yeah, we can accelerate this plan because this is already proposed by President Xi Jinping." And then after a feasibility study, and they believe this is a very good idea. So because this is meeting the needs here domestically as well as globally. Also, we have to encourage this entrepreneurship across the city. And Quanzhou, I believe, is one of the best cities in China in this regard. And we're talking about people from EU and the Jews and people from Wenzhou. And we're just keeping a very low profile. People in Quanzhou, we are.、Uh, Just doing great in terms of entrepreneurship, we have this、uh, endeavoring spirit and this fighting spirit that never stops. Also, we have to work closely together for teamwork. We have to pull our strengths together, integrate our resources together for the、uh, skill of economy. Why the、uh, other regions are well developed? Because they work closely together with friends, with partners, with family members. We have to travel a road different from the West. The West developed in the very beginning through exploitation of、uh, natural resources, but in China we are embracing the skill of economy from the very beginning. By working closely together with、uh, different business partners, and this, I believe, is the spirit of teamwork, the spirit of pulling together our strengths.、Uh, a lot of the places 
they don't have this kind of spirit, and they engage in、um, malignant.、Uh, they engage in a malicious competition. And here in this part of the country, we also are willing to、uh, pioneer into、uh, things that no one did before. From the very beginning,、uh, I believe a lot of the、uh, businessmen here are just working as a couple. So they have a small workshop, and then they、uh, dramatically expand their、uh, workshop, and then they have their own branding, and then marketing, and then international development. So basically, they have gone through a stage of nine phases,、uh, and then second stage is branding and skill economy. And then their brand is well known across the world, and that is why they have high quality development. So whenever you have some difficulties in terms of operation, we can make some a quick adjustment and then、uh, start again. But this is not a spirit owned by other places. So that's why I say、uh, this place is very unique. Many places are simply relying on their resources and energy, and this is not right. What if one day the resources is fully exploited and is used up? So this is、uh, not like what we are doing here. We are being very nimble and flexible, and we are innovative. And when we encounter some problems, we can make immediate adjustment. Also, we have rich cultural、uh, resources and heritage, but there are a lot of cities in China with culture, but they haven't developed their cultural industry. This is not the case here in Quanzhou. In Quanzhou, we are being、uh, selected as a world cultural heritage.、Um, Beijing, for example, has the history of only 800 years, but here in Quanzhou, we have a history of 3,000 years. We are known for our sea port, and we have a history of 3,000 years, thanks to the、uh, maritime、uh, Silk Road. So we have a profound culture, and it's not just a opera that you see, it's not just the tea you drink. So the culture is an industry, it's a resource, and culture is something that we can capitalize, and culture can empower the development of a city. To just give you one example, this one, for example, this is only selling at the price of 100 yuan. But if I tell you this is made in Quanzhou, or this has been used by、uh, Einstein, so how much is it? Maybe this is, this can be sold at the price of one million. So there is this cultural、uh, element in it. And culture will never go out of fashion, and culture will only bring you more added value. And there is a lot that I can talk about culture. But if you can regard culture as technology, and as、uh, technology, and there is a lot that you can tap, and the、uh, possibility is just enormous. And also very developed private economy.、Uh, I will skip this, and this is well known. And also we have a lot of resources of overseas Chinese from Quanzhou. So what does that mean? This means we have a strong shopping power. For example, we have、uh, overseas Chinese who are purchasing traditional Chinese medicine, exported from China, and they can also serve as an important bond. And bridge between Chinese and the West, and they can help us do marketing. And Quanzhou has more than 10 million people. And bearing in mind that overseas we have a lot of people from Quanzhou that are living in a lot of countries. So what are the shortfalls, and what are the drawbacks? Drawbacks of Quanzhou. I believe, and there is a lot of potential that we can. Tap in terms of、uh, technological innovation, and right now the intensity of、uh, the intensity of investment in R and D is two point four percent in Korea, 
is 2.5 percent in Shenzhen, and they have the plan by 2025, R&D investment could reach 5 to 6 percent. So this is doubling our current uh, standing. So we have to uh, dramatically uh, ramp, up, ramp up our effort in this regard. So we have to engage in the culturally creative industry, uh, industries where culture can play a empowering role. For example, if you are selling a garment, then you say the garment was ever used by an emperor in Song Dynasty. So this is just to give you one example. So there is a lot of culture that we can tap. We have a lot of cultural resources. Uh, all the other regions, they are also talking about culture, but there is no credibility. And this is not the case in Quanzhou. And Quanzhou is well known already with its uh, cultural heritage. If you have been to Tengchong, you know there is this uh, ancient uh, tea pass, and they produced that into a movie or into a drama. And they want uh, all the tourists, uh, they want to go there. And they are willing to spend 100 yuan for that. And the Marine Time Silk Road is a much bigger story, and we have we can um, make a lot of uh, dramas and operas and cultural uh, programs on the basis of the Maritime Silk Road. The third proposal I have is that we, ha we can uh, center on this uh, central uh, city, um, Maritime Silk Road. The Maritime Silk Road actually has uh, three routes, and there is a lot of uh, potential in this regard as well, and the central government is paying a lot of attention. So we can invest in more resources uh, to uh, this particular subject because we are connected to the Indian Ocean, to the uh, Atlantic, to Africa, and to Antarctic. So this is quite amazing. For example, we are also connected to uh, Malaysia. So we are the starting point of the Maritime uh, Silk Road. Uh, for example, we are operating a port in Greece, and a, a state-owned enterprise in China is now taking 87% of the share of this uh, port. And each and every year, it's creating 10,000 jobs. And no wonder the great people, they are so excited about our cooperation program. So we are the starting point of the Maritime Silk Road, and we have to align our development to the uh, national uh, strategy, and also engage in international economic and trade cooperation and build our city into a regional center for the Maritime Silk Road strategy. And there are a lot of experience regarding high-quality development. I think there are some available experience from all around the world that we can draw upon. And we can always learn from other cities as long as there is some similarity between us and those other cities. For example, Singapore. Singapore was established in 1965. When it was just established, it didn't have economic independence. It didn't have any economy. At the very beginning, it was just $1.1 billion in terms of GDP. But right now, it's having a GDP of more than $400 billion. So how many folds we're talking about here? It's 400 folds. And the per capita GDP is $73,000 and it's ranking first in Asia. It doesn't have any natural resources. It's just a small city country, and you can benchmark your city uh, with the development of Singapore. The Singapore can teach us a lot about the industrial structure. It is the international shipping center, a financial center, a trade center, and also it's a center that has gathered a lot of the high-end industries in the world. 
for example, its information industry is second to none in Asia. For example, it's producing a lot of、uh, chips. And it's also keeping a low profile. It's not being、um, loud in、um, broadcasting its different industries and petrochemical industry as well. Many、uh, big petrochemical enterprises in the world have a branch or representative office in Singapore. They pay a lot of attention to education.、Uh, they're not going fully、uh, to the west. Quite on the contrary, they feature a combination between the east and west, and they focus also on the、uh, Confucianism, and they combine Confucius、uh, philosophy with the、uh, values and thinking of the west. And there is a huge number of talents. They try to bring in international students, including those from China. And they have a very low tax rate.、Uh, the only tax they have for foreign enterprises is the 20% percent、uh, corporate income tax. If you are a high-tech company,、uh, you don't need to pay tax for 10 years. Your investment in research and development will be、uh, deducted by two times in terms of、uh, tax rebate. So this is something we can learn from, and the. Are willing to bring in talents.、Uh, the government is featuring high level of integrity. And the、uh, founding father of、uh, Singapore,、uh, Li Kuan Yew, has been living in a small cottage for decades. So that is why the、uh, business environment of Singapore has been rated、really、top three for quite a number of years by the standards of the World Bank. So we can benchmark ourselves with Singapore as well as Hong Kong, and there are a lot that we can learn from them. And the other cities, I should mention, is、uh, Hong Kong and Dubai, and those are、uh, shipping centers, trading centers, as well as financial centers. And we can draw some experience from their success, because they have very high level industrial structure. Also, we can learn from Beijing in the field of、uh, culturally creative industry. In Beijing, the culture is now accounting for 50 percent of its GDP, and the culture sector alone has a total volume of more than one、uh, more than、uh, one trillion RMB. In 2018,、uh, the city of Beijing introduced a government guidance document to focus on nine particular industries. Animation industry, for example, is accounting for one third of the country. So it's paying a lot of attention to the、uh, cultural industry. And bearing in mind that Beijing only has the history of 800 years as a capital city, but we have a history of more than 3,000 years. So you can greatly tap your uh, cultural uh, potential. Also, we need to. Develop our high-tech industry. For example, in the future,、uh, brain science, deep sea technology,、uh, quantum physics, and those are the、uh, frontier subjects. And the same goes to to、um, genetic engineering. And there are new and innovative uh, medical um, breakthroughs such as uh, removing uh, your bad genes and. Transplanting the good genes, so this is quite encouraging.、Uh, biomedicine is another、uh, frontier、uh, subject, and we have to be ready for that.、Um, because, for example, one bottle of drug can be sold at the price of two hundred and eighty thousand yuan. So there is a lot of added value for those、uh, high-tech products, and we have to build a. Full industrial chain for those high technologies, and we need to combine the、uh, market demand with the high-quality science and technology. 
so that we can truly connect uh, scientific and technological research with uh, market activities. So we can also learn from Lin Yi in terms of the logistics industry. And logisti the logistics industry of Lin Yi is 30% uh, lower than the national average. So Lin Yi is also a coastal city, and there's a lot of similarities between our two cities. Also, we have to engage in international cooperation. We have to go global. We have to work with other countries building high-tech parks. And we also need to build research and development centers in other countries. Even though when we are talking about a traditional uh, industry, we can build some um, collaborative uh, research centers with other countries. For example, BGI is uh, setting up a agricultural science demonstration park with Laos and the uh, researching into a lot of the uh, breeds and germplasm resources. My second proposal to you is that we have to hold high the banner of culture, uh, allow culture to serve our modern service industry. And when we develop culture, we have to have our eyes wide open to the whole world. We need to benchmark ourselves with all those uh, very famous cultural cities in the world. The government, the media, industrial associations, and the enterprises, we have to work together to translate uh, brand the city and to make it well known across the world. For example, once uh, there was a sportswear brand that was uh, quickly uh, becoming popular simply because the Olympic champion Kong Linghui uh, wore uh, the shirt in front of national audience. So there's a lot that we can think in terms of how to make our brands well known. As for international development, we have already made great achievements, in particular in the fields of uh, trade. But there is still a lot of potential. I looked at your trade structure, and I believe no matter it is the commodities structure or the market structure or the trading uh, methodologies, and there are great potentials in all those categories. In the meantime, we have to integrate domestic and international resources. Also, there are resources at the uh, ministeri ministerial uh, level. We have to work closely together with these different ministries at the central government level. For example, there are national level economic and trade promotion fairs, and we can use those opportunities to market ourselves, to make ourselves uh, better exposed through a number of uh, meetings. For example, CCPIT is a great resource. Uh, we are working closely together for those uh, World, uh, World Horticulture Expo and World Expo. I propose to the central government that we have to move those important expositions to the central and western part of China so that we can benefit more cities. So we as a local city, we have to work with the central government to uh, struggle to, to make sure that uh, there are such opportunities coming to our place. And to just give you one example, the uh, Ekaterinburg is a small city in Russia, but this city is hosting the uh, BRICS summit. So we have to obtain more international resources through the organization of major forums and expositions. And we have to build research uh, centers in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, and also build up, build up production centers in China's west and in the central part of the country. Because in some of those regions, they have very good uh, tax policies. For example, Suzhou is right now building an industrial park with Singapore. 
and they have already made a lot of success. And Fujian is working together with Philippines, with Vietnam. So we should know all those uh, cooperation mechanisms going on and see where and how we can align ourselves to uh, those development strategies. And there is a lot of potential we can tap in this regard, I can tell you with great certainty. And also we have to build Chenzhou into a uh, city that carries the business uh, card of the Maritime Silk Road. So we have to uh, tell the China story with Chenzhou as the representative. So Chenzhou can tell a lot about the brands in China and the values of China. So and there's a lot that we can highlight about our culture. For example, the Belt and Road Initiative features the spirits of uh, joint contribution, shared um, benefit, and collaborative uh, consultation. Uh, throughout history, Quanzhou people have been the representatives of Chinese because we are the first to have uh, traveled to other countries and telling them what a great country we have today. And today, again, we are talking about the uh, rejuvenation of our nation. Uh, there is equally much that we can do to tell the China story well, and we can see greater internationalized development by going global. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu. Uh, may I ask you to uh, to stay uh, for some questions? And we have collected some questions. And Mr. Liu is a professor at the uh, Central University of Fanos. Uh, normally, if you want to hear his lecture, you'd have to be first a, a student at the Central University of University. So Central University of Fanos. So this is truly a rare opportunity. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and we're going to give you a mic. Any questions? <laughs> May I ask you the question of how the enterprises in other countries are coping with the COVID-19? And what experience can we draw from their experience in fighting the COVID-19? Well, we are right now, uh, we have passed the uh, most difficult days, and there are still uncertainties in the days and years ahead. And COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a heavy blow to all the enterprises, and this is the question on the minds of each and every entrepreneur. No matter it is domestic development or international development, safety must come always in the first place, the safety of health, the safety of our properties. And there are already a lot of experience here domestically. And we have some uh, change enterprises that are also operating at the global level. Uh, let me share with you some of my own observations. The first is industrial transformation. We have to be nimble and flexible. When the pandemic is uh, breaking out, uh, the logistics has been affected and people are staying indoors, people are not spending money like before. So what should we do? We as an enterprise, we can change our product portfolio. If we found out that our products don't sell, then we can produce something else. We can produce the things that people consume during the pandemic. And a lot of the enterprises, they immediately started to produce uh, PPEs, uh, uh, for example, masks and protective suits. And there are Chinese companies doing that. And there are also a lot of international companies making such quick and similar uh, transitions. My second 
suggestion is to、uh, produce those、uh, high added value products. For example, if you were a restaurant, in the past you have delivery service.、Uh, in the past, maybe we have、uh, 100 dishes on our menu. But when the pandemic's here, it's not feasible for us to、um, deliver 100 dishes to our customers. So when the pandemic is around, we can downsize that to 30 dishes on our on our menu. So that is the road path traveled by Huawei.、Uh, if you look at the revenue of Huawei, it has significantly shrinked last year, but the profit has increased on the country. So what is the R and D investment of、uh, Huawei? Huawei is 22.4 percent, but China's national average is 2.4 percent. So Huawei is standing at 10 times more in terms of、uh, research and development uh, research uh, investment. But Huawei is not the best, and there are enterprises investing 28 percent. For example, Qualcomm is investing 31 percent of their Uh, profit in research and development. So this is just one of my suggestions. You can dramatically improve the added value of your product.、Uh, right now, there are the、uh, confrontations between China and West, and that is reflected in the fields of、uh, industrial chain and supply chain. So, if you are an enterprise and you anticipate that there are some、uh, geopolitical tensions, and you can maybe、uh, stock up some inventory, such as chips, the pharmaceutical companies, and they are complaining. For example, they don't have the、uh, test kit, and they don't have the raw materials. In the past. They only needed to wait for ten days, but right now they have to wait for half a year. And I told them, why not build a, a, a warehouse? And why not build a warehouse in a foreign country?、Uh, if one enterprise does not have the energy to、um, build up such a warehouse, and why, why not all the enterprises put together and work together in building some、uh, warehouses to stock up some materials? So the enterprises, you can act up. First, and we can form a、uh, closed loop just to get ourselves better prepared. Also, my、uh, third suggestion is digital development, and we can develop, for example, cloud exhibitions and cross-border exhibition industry. And the profit is also、uh, quite amazing, and it's 10% larger than the traditional industries. Also, we have to put safety in the first place, and we have to take safe measures. No matter when we are working together with the governments or working with、uh, other companies or working on our own, we have to make a lot of contingency、uh, plans just to、uh, just to be、uh, safe. Any other questions? Good morning,、uh, Mr. Liu.、Uh, you mentioned that we have profound、uh, rich cultural resources, and we are a world cultural heritage. And you talked about the relationship between culture and economy. And can you be more、uh, specific? Can you elaborate on how culture can empower economic development? Are there any available experience from overseas? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your question. As I mentioned earlier, culture can be me- measured in many different dimensions, and culture is not just culture; it's an in- industry. If you have rich、uh, cultural resources, you can dramatically、uh, develop other industries. For example, tourism. For example, the、uh, intangible cultural heritage is attracting a huge amount of tourists. In Quanzhou and、uh, around the world, there are a huge amount of tourists who want to come to Quanzhou to take a look at our intangible cultural heritage. So you can develop culture into an industry. 
if it expands to tourism, the tourism has a very long industrial chain, and the industrial chain and the supply chain and they can be well aligned. So we can simply streamline our industrial chain and take a closer look at the different linkage point in the chain and make the decision where should we improve, uh, what are the gaps that we need to fill, and uh, we can take a deeper look at our cultural industrial chain. And in the cultural industry, the most important one is innovation, and uh, we need to bring in talents, and we need to strengthen exchanges between the cultural uh, figures. For example, if we could invite the f famous film director Zhang Yimou here to uh, produce a macro uh, video, video, and then maybe we can create an economic value of uh, tens of billions of RMB. So there's a lot of potential that we can tap in this regard. Also, culture as an element, it can empower other industries and culture in itself is the brand, and culture can amplify the brand image of some of the other sectors. And if you can, for example, expose yourself through Channel Central Television, uh, through all the online platforms, you can dramatically expose yourself. And culture can also be integrated with all the different sectors of the manufacturing industry. We have a history of 3,000 years. And we just need to tap into uh, the different sides of culture. Uh, for example, in Beijing, uh, there was a restaurant that is delivering dishes uh, in the style of the Republic of China period. Uh, if they tell the uh, gourmets that uh, this dish was uh, once liked by uh, Yuan Shikai, so it can sell. So many sectors, many government agencies have realized the importance of culture, and we can simply focus on culture. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Liu, and let's uh, give him a big round of applause. All right. We're going to reset our stage, and we're going to have an entrepreneur salon and uh, just Hold on a few minutes. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. What's the color palette of Chenzhou? Is it blue? A nation Chinese port along the historic maritime Silk Road and an economic and trade powerhouse on China's southeast coast. Or it can be green. An environment-friendly city that's ideal for living. Ability to foster innovation and stable business environment. Or deep red. Historic buildings standing side by side to gleaming modern architectures and gentle sounds of the night music mixed with vibrancy of the night market. Join us in Quanzhou. Only on Global Business, only on CGTN. The master said that I have a good sound. I could play it in front of the royal family in Tang Dynasty. In this temple, you will find all different kinds of amazing fusions. Look, you can even find Sphinx.
I believe that the fragrance of these floral headgear can please themselves and also relieve their fatigue. Man, I feel like I am making the movement instead of the puppy. Oh no, wait, this is more like me. It's so nice if you can have your loved one to watch this lantern with you. Mr. Lee's ideas were way ahead of his time. I suspect he was a time traveler. A thousand years ago, merchants from all over the world they traveled across the sea, first landed here, following these steps, and set foot in Quanzhou. The pioneering spirit of Quanzhou is everywhere. Hmm. Look at this. I'm wondering who discovered this edible thing. Quanzhou people were so upset in building pagodas in ancient times. I have one right here. Call me Tuota Chen Tianwang. Hello, I'm Lin Liang. I'm Xiao Qing. Wendy. Guo Heng. Xiaolin. Yu Ying. I'm Zheng Ping. I'm Hannah. I am Lin Jingyi. Zaitong Fan Get. Zaitong Fan Get. Zaitong Fan Get. Zaitong Fan Get. Get Fan in Quanzhou. Zaitong Fan Get. Get Fan in Quanzhou. Come on. World Heritage City welcomes you. World Heritage City welcomes you. World Heritage City welcomes you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. 感谢各位回到我们的万亿城市大讲堂的舞台上。那么今天呢，我们还有一个非常精彩的环节，就是企业家沙龙。我们有幸的邀请到了四位来自泉州的卓越的企业家。呃，他们当中有几位是我们这个业内的老前辈。And we have one very important session that is the entrepreneurs salon, and we have four entrepreneurs. Some of them are well known, and we also have two younger generation of entrepreneurs. And let me give you one introduction. Mr. Liu, you already know him very well. He spoke for one hour. And uh, sitting on his left is Fu Pinghuang and Quanzhou uh, Stocks Corporation. And Zheng Pengfei, uh, general manager of uh, Shunpeng Company. Huang Junpeng, uh, Fujian Road and Ports Company, and Cai Cai Hong, uh, Quanzhou Commerce Council Secretary. I welcome you all. So we invite you here because we want to hear your story so that we can know what is the city of Quanzhou like and what is the entrepreneurial spirit of uh, Quanzhou. So this is the Chinese anniversary of the Jinjiang experience. So my first question to all of you is, what is your reading of the Jinjiang experience? Can I go with you? And regarding the Jinjiang experience, I believe it's solidarity and a endeavoring uh, spirit. So it is this. Uh, local sound that we have been uh, singing for years, and only with Endeavor can we win together. So how many people do you have in your company? So my company was established in 1979. We have a, a Germany branch, Austria branch, and Italy uh, branch. And those three companies are basically focusing on technology. And we have a production base in Quanzhou. And then we have this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And now we have uh, gone global to India. And we also have a presence in Indonesia. And this year we are planning to go to uh, Brazil, building another production base so we can truly uh, produce more products.
because you have been doing just one product for 40 years, and do you think this is one of the core values of entrepreneurs here? Well, yes. Uh, we just focus on one product, and we are very meticulous, and we focus on professionalism, and we want to deliver the best, the most recognized product in the world. And when you are doing something for such a long time, there is a lot of uh, emotional bond between you and the product. All the products that we produce are featuring original design. I have been doing this for 42 years. We have more than 100 enterprises. We have a presence all over the world. Uh, if we don't produce our products, uh, we are hurting also the hundreds of uh, the suppliers we have around the world. And if we don't produce, and then they're going to be out of their business. So, uh, Mr. Zheng, uh, what is your experience on the Xinjiang experience? Well, my understanding is that you have to be bold, you have to be uh, courageous. In the meantime, you have to be down to earth, be committed to the day-to-day -day, uh, details, and also you have to be innovative and do what you like and do it well. So from the development journey of Shunmei, uh, where do you think you are most pioneering? At the very beginning, I was doing ceramics. I have been doing that for quite a number of years. In Quanzhou, Shimei was among the first companies to go global, and we expanded our overseas market. So I believe we were the first enterprise learning the Jinjiang experience. So you went global and sold a lot of your products, yes. And right now you are taking bigger steps, definitely. And nothing would be developing so smoothly, but we were persistent. And we believe um, persistence would lead to success. And we have to constantly adjust ourselves and face the reality. So behind this Jinjiang experience, uh, the uh, fighting, endeavoring uh, spirits of countless uh, number of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, now let's hear what Mr. Huang has to say. And uh, I guess you were born in the 1990s. Yes, I was born exactly in the year of 1990. So what is your experience? What is your understanding of the Jinjiang experience? So this year marks the 20th anniversary of Jinjiang experience. And there has been a lot of discussion on this Jinjiang experience for me personally. I have seen a lot of business. And there is uh, the uh, a spirit of uh, entrepreneurship of Jinjiang experience that is applicable uh, all across the world. And that is being bold, being courageous, and dare to take the risks. And there is something also special for the Jinjiang experience. And because Jinjiang is located in the uh, southern part of uh, Fujian. And from me uh, personally, and from the perspective of corporate enterprise and the company that I'm working on was established by my father in 2005. And this is a construction company. But prior to 2005, the company actually already existed uh, it's actually started from the 1980s. Uh, he was born in Hongwei town of Nan'an city. It was a very famous uh, commerce town. And we were, the, we were one of the poorest uh, families in the, in the town. And 
his parents died at a young age, so he was raised by his grandmother. And what he does each and every day is to um, to uh, take care of the cow in the morning, and after that, uh, he went to a school. And he was reading uh, very hard, and then he became the only college student in his uh, village. And then he entered into a state-owned enterprise. And because of the restructuring, he uh, quit the job and started his own company. So this is quite an exciting story. And nothing was smooth uh, since he established the company in 2005. I have gone through middle school, high school, and university. I have seen him very excited and sometimes very uh, puzzled. Uh, he brings a lot of the work to the home. And I can see whether he is happy or frustrated. But no matter how frustrated he is at home, the second day he goes back to his work, he's like an iron man, uh, spreading the spirit of uh, persistence and determination. So when I first graduated, from university, I went to an investment company. I saw a lot of entrepreneurs, and they are from all the different regions, and they are very uh, courageous, and they are from different sectors. Uh, some of them, of course, were at a uh, older age than me. But there is one quality that I can tell uh, instantly, and I can tell immediately whether a person is from the southern of Fujian, and they are very down to earth, they are very pragmatic, and they are very efficient. So I believe the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs from the southern part of Fujian, they would invite you to a tea, and this is not a waste of time. And if you don't get into the topic in the first five minutes, and they're going to ask you, what is the topic of our conversation today? So that is the spirit of the um, entrepreneurs in this part of the country, and they are very uh, pragmatic, they are very efficient, and we have very limited natural resources. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, thousands of the people here in Quanzhou we went abroad to the Southeast Asia to other countries. Why was that? Because there weren't uh, sufficient natural resources to uh, feed the local people. So we are very courageous, and we have the. Uh, best courage to uh, start a business and to take the risks. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Huang. And I think you said it very well um, for the young generation. Uh, you learned the Jinjiang experience from your um, fathers, uh, from the last generation. And they are very uh, persistent. And they could endure the hardships. And that is truly amazing. And they didn't see a good picture from the very beginning, but they were just walking and walking, and then gradually they created a better uh, picture and better tomorrow. I believe that as long as you uh, tell the story to uh, other people, they're going to know this is an entrepreneur from the southern part of uh, Fujian. We also have uh, Chairman uh, Madam Tsai here. and. Uh, uh, Ms. Chai, I believe you have seen a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, some are old, some are young, and they are equally creators. Uh, where do you envision the future of the Jinjiang experience? So from your perspective, what do you see is the future of Jinjiang experience, and where do you need the support from the government? Well, I think uh, those before me, they have said it very well. I believe there is one characteristic of Jinjiang experience is to uh, seek something new and reform. So we are the second generation entrepreneurs, and we are very lucky. Uh, we are living in such a great times. Take my. Enterprise, uh, enterprise, for example, uh, it was established by my mother uh, 20 years ago. 
and before the year 2000, I watched her grow her business. Uh, she has endured a lot of hardships. The entrepreneurs in the southern part of Fujian, they are truly daring and they are truly bold. and They are willing to take risks and they don't uh, walk back in front of failure. And even when there's failure, there is this uh, courage and they uh, they would uh, immediately adjust and then try again. So this is the spirit of the uh, Jinjiang experience. And we are doing real economy, and there's a lot of uh, uh, spirit that we need, and we cannot uh, speculate, and we have to insist on those uh, good fighting spirit. So Mr. Liu, I would like to ask you again. So this is the 20th uh, year for Jinjiang experience. Uh, over the past 20 years, the world has changed dramatically. Uh, a lot of the first generation entrepreneurs and they are passing down their business to their second generation. So how should we sustain the Jinjiang experience and what implications does it have in this new era? Well, thank you very much. I believe uh, this is a panel with a very good structure. We have the old guys like me and we also have the young folks the young entrepreneurs. And well, 30 years ago, if we travel back 30 years ago, we would be regarded as the senior uh, entrepreneurs and the senior guys. I think you said it very well just now. Uh, you interpreted the Jinjiang experience or Jinjiang spirit from many different angles. I think you have summarized this uh, Jinjiang experience very well, and you said this is about uh, courage, about willing to take risks and persistence. But let me add a few words. And the first is, of course, as you have mentioned, we are willing to pioneer, we are willing to uh, take a try and to take risks. So we dare to take the risk to make something out of nothing. And we don't stop when we are successful. And we never are complacent. We are constantly innovative. We are constantly taking risks and expanding our business. And this is the other fold of the Jinjiang experience. And this is something we all need as an, an entrepreneur. So this is the entrepreneurship that we need to uh, hold dear to no matter when. And also they are very agile, they are very nimble, they are very flexible, and each time there is an adjustment and they are very sharp with their, uh, with their uh, insightfulness and with their vision. And they are not just good at being a visionary and they are pragmatic. And they are also honest and sincere in doing their business, just as uh, President Xi Jinping has mentioned that they are very pragmatic and they know uh, what basic conditions that they have and they are never being too uh, imaginary. They always combine their vision and, and dream with the realities. In China, we have seen a lot of the uh, entrepreneurs who are too ambitious, for example, when there is realistic, when the re realistic industry is at a time, we go to the realistic industry. When finance industry is at its peak, we go to the financial industry. So this is not going to work. We have been quite persistent as entrepreneurs in the southern part of Fujian. And right now, there are a lot of industrial upgrading and transformations, but not all the transformations are positive. Uh, a lot of the enterprises, they are moving their business to overseas, and this is not necessarily a good thing, because here locally, we can change our business. We can transfer, for example, to the western and central part of China. And there is a lot of space that we can 
we can make, we can utilize in China, and we cannot uh, be like this one day and that and be a different uh, business the next day. So um, persistence is one key aspect of the Xinjiang experience, and also quality. And quality is one very fundamental thing, and only with quality can we win the market. So these are the entrepreneurship, the pioneering, and bold and creative spirit manifested by those uh, entrepreneurs in this part of the country. And I hope that these spirits can be uh, sustained in the coming years. Well, I believe. Um, Mr. Liu has talked about the inheritance as well as the innovation. Uh, he talked about the transformation of enterprise, for example, smart manufacturing and digital innovation. Those are the key words. Uh, so 40 years, you have been doing one product. And uh, so anything you can see about transformation? So there are three stages of my industry, uh, half automation and then fully automation. Well, during the pandemic, we experienced a lot of hardships in terms of seal, and then we just worked together with other enterprises, and we simply process the, uh, uh, the parts uh, given to us by other companies. For example, we are doing uh, transducers, and we looked at the different components and the electronic uh, parts. And when we sell our transducers, uh, we send our own people to install. In the future, we're going to go digital, we're going to go smart. In the future, it would be Um, it would be automatic. No human labor would be needed. And we have been doing this very well. For example, when we were in India, and they are very satisfied with our products, and, and we give them some uh, half autonomous uh, parts to uh, produce. In China, the production cost is very high, and at the time, we only spent 200 million yuan to acquire this technology from uh, Germany. Uh, right now, we are further developing this industry here in China as well as in India. So the automation technology was uh, further developed by our company. But then we found out that installation was a big issue in India, and the average uh, wage of employees in India was now very high, and there's a lot of difficulties in training the local employees in terms of uh, installation of the transducers. So we have to learn from Europe and the United States. Uh, if you look at the production volume in other countries, it can be very high, it can be very low. And that is especially the case in India. And right now, we are moving our business to Africa. And we attend those engineering exhibition fairs around the world. And traditionally, you could not find these exhibitions in China because why? Because it's pointless. Even if they uh, exhibit their products in China, no buyers would be interested. But right now, China is now taking the center stage. And there are, for example, 100 companies in China that are doing exactly the same thing as my company. At the very beginning, we didn't know anything, but right now, our product accounts for 90% of the market share globally.
even those European and American companies, they are not our competitors. They cannot compete us. And because we have been doing this for quite a number of years, and we have all the knowledge and expertise and experience, and we know how to operate our business. So we have been actually learning from the other companies, and that's how we grow. So in this market, I believe you have already consolidated your position, even globally. And constant innovation is the core spirit of Jinjiang Experience. And when you help the clients with smart management, and when you see green transformation, what efforts have you made? I once watched a news coverage that you installed a camera at the edge of your uh, machinery so that you can enable better smart management. Yes, right now we do not just have a uh, camera, we have uh, AI and with just a goggle, we are able to tell how to install the transducers. And since the COVID-19 pandemic, we have focused primarily on this product. And then we were having a lot of receivables in the immediate aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic because the clients they couldn't pay us immediately. Uh, but despite of this hardship, we focused on developing the AI and we can analyze how much electricity and water and gas that we consume on a daily basis. And with this small system, we can very accurately predict the energy uh, consumption each day. And the foundation comes from two parts. The first is our um, persistence in this technology. Secondly, we are working together with uh, uh, Guangzhou University, Xiamen University, and a number of universities and working together with the research institutions to research and further develop our industry. So right now, we are focusing on going digital, going smart. So right now on our phone, we can see what we are producing every day in a plant. We can supervise uh, the process in a factory, and we know where our sales persons are each and every day. And we know what are the key technicians doing every day. So to go digital, we actually have accumulated the technology for 15 years. And right now, we are moving from digital to uh, smart. Uh, this is the direction going forward. Well, thank you very much. I'm talking about digital and smart. And let me ask you, Mr. Zheng, I believe we have been to your company. You showed the world the white porcelain of China, how beautiful it is, and there's a lot of uh, digital transformation uh, in that. And we like the Bing Dun Dun and Shai Rong Rong, and what are the uh, science and technology in those products? <laughs> the Winter Olympic mascots are very popular on the Chinese market, uh, even in the world, and that is made by of course, the uh, porcelain and the ceramics of Quanzhou, the Bing Dun Dun and Shai Rong Rong made of um, ceramics and porcelain. They sell much better because China ware is only an originally produced in China, so this can demonstrate the image of China. The Winter Olympics belongs to the whole world, but pottery is Chinese, and we are using environmentally friendly pottery. Uh, it's degradable. So this is a very good design, and it's eco-friendly design. And this is well aligned with the 
uh, spirits and principles of the Winter Olympics. So as Mr. Liu has mentioned in his presentation, this is how culture empowers the different industries. And this is a very good example. And I know you're producing a very, a very uh, delicate uh, white porcelain. And you are also a company doing very successfully in cultural tourism. And what future plans do you have in this industry? In 2013, We built the Museum of uh, Digital Porcelain, and right now it has become a tourist attraction. It is also a exchange center for overseas Chinese. As Mr. Zheng has mentioned, and Mr. Liu has mentioned earlier, we are going to combine culture with this business with the uh, pottery so that more people can experience the charm of the pottery culture. And they can come here to gain some understanding about the culture related to the maritime Silk Road. And when they come here, they're going to experience the best of the parsley and pottery that we can offer the best channelware. And also in terms of quality and innovation, we have been wrapping up our efforts. For example, we talked about the white porcelain and we have produced a lot of vases. The Chinese white, we want it to be better recognized all across the world. And this is a grand uh, undertaking for thousands of years. And because for thousands of years, China ware and pottery and Chinese porcelain, they are considered a luxury brand. So we want to make more friends around the world. I believe the Belt and Road Initiative offers just this opportunity. And when we make more friends, we can sell our products to more customers in the world. And I believe that the culture of Chenzhou can be learned across the world. So and that is why we have to reiterate uh, cultural confidence and cultural upgrading and cultural empowerment. And this is associated with also the integrity of the Chenzhou people. The people of Quanzhou are excellent people, even at the world class, even at the global level. So we have to go global and make more friends. So I believe that there is this uh, cultural element that is underpinning the success of your business. All right, let's now turn to the young entrepreneurs present here. And I know that on uh, your website, you have the slogan of uh, building better roads and better life. And we hope life can be better, healthier, and greener. And road infrastructure is something that can apply the concepts of green development and digital technology. And what is your observation and thinking in this regard? Well, digital transformation has been going on for 10 years. And that is especially true for the construction industry. Around 2010, that is 10 years ago, and people were all talking about qualifications. For example, do you have the qualification of uh, contracting a project? And we spend a lot of efforts in this regard, and that is how we uh, elevated from a, a third level enterprise to now a first level enterprise. And we have all the different licenses and qualifications in terms of uh, cement and construction and engineering. Over the past two to three years, competition has changed, transitioning from qualification to brand and to uh, credibility. And there is a credit system amongst uh, construction enterprises over the past three years, and we spent 
a lot of efforts in this regard, and we are now ranking top 10 across the province, and that has brought a lot of opportunities for us. We have some slogans focusing on quality and safety. So if you tell the slogan of safety and quality, you can be trusted by your clients, and that is very important for a construction enterprise. And right now, we are at the season of uh, recruitment. So I tell my people, when you go to those universities, you should tell them the image of our enterprise and what kind of image you are spreading for this enterprise on those campus. Well, I believe at the uh, job fair, it's just like students walking into a supermarket and what kind of goods they want to buy. And you have to convey a good image of the company. So that is why we have the slogan of uh, better roads and better life. And this is also a industry related to the logistics industry. And we are the young generation. We grew up with uh, smartphones and uh, personal laptops. And we are actually a miniature of the construction industry. Uh, last month in Fuzhou, we held the uh, Digital uh, Construction Summit. Uh, in Quanzhou, there was a uh, parallel session about digital development of the construction industry. And I shared with the industry a very interesting set of data. And I said that construction industry last year surpassed agriculture industry and becoming the industry with the lowest level of uh, digitalization. So we are less digital even uh, than the agriculture industry. So it means we have a huge gap to fill. Uh, we are talking about big data. Uh, we're talking about the uh, protection of uh, intellectual property. And there are some copycats going on in the world. And let me tell you, the construction materials can hardly be uh, replicated in other places. So for the uh, construction uh, products, and when we produce something, it's in a scale of uh, 100,000 pieces or units. So we hope we can embrace science and technology to better protect our industry, and because there is a lot of need from the market. And right now, the human uh, labor cost is going up. And we are running a shortage of construction workers. And right now, if you go to the construction sites, you can barely see any young people. Most of them are at their 50s and 60s, and they're old people. So digital is one urgent need for this industry. And we have to replace human labor with a lot of uh, machineries and robots. And we have some of that, but it's not quite um, uh, popular uh, within this industry. Uh, we have talked with some software and hardware companies, and we tell them what kind of robots that we need. But they don't deliver exactly uh, satisfactory solutions, and we hope that there can be a greater development in the uh, digital industry, and it can be better applied to our construction industry. Well, you said it very well. You said uh, the um, construction materials and then job fairs on a campus, and you are the new generation of entrepreneurs, and you have a lot of considerations, and you have to, as you said, pay attention to the uh, social image of your enterprise and also the um, social responsibility of an enterprise. And now let me ask you, uh, Ms. Chai, uh, one day when I was uh, driving along the uh, coastline and I saw a chimney, but it's not giving any smoke. And I told my friends that it must be closed. But then my friend told me, no, this is an eco-friendly uh, sewage uh, treatment plant, and it's not giving a smoke that with color. And th later I learned that uh, Ms. Chai is actually uh, taking care of this plant. So as a new generation of entrepreneur, uh, what do you see green industry? 
uh, how green development can be applied to many of the different sectors. So I have been in the environment industry for like uh, 10 years uh, since I graduated from overseas. We have seen the process of green transformation. And this plant that you were talking about, this is the first amongst all the private enterprises in China. We have gone through our twists and turns. Uh, throughout the development journey, we have been readjusting ourselves and reforming. Uh, traditionally, we used to have 200 people. Right now, we only have uh, 10 people. And we invested 600 million RMB to upgrade the facility. And right now, we are doing the exterior uh, decoration. Uh, in the future, we're going to also build a cultural education base. And by that time, I hope to welcome all of all of you to uh, our plant. So as Mr. Huang was talking about, green development is one of the parameters of high quality development. Uh, we were talking about CCER, uh, the uh, carbon exchange, uh, carbon emission exchange. Uh, we are able to reduce the carbon emission by 6 million tons. Um, by the 25th of this month, we're going to invite an expert on carbon neutrality to give a lecture in our company because carbon neutrality and carbon peak are the ambitious goals are laid out at the central government level. And this is going to fundamentally change the way we live and work. In the early years, we were not paying attention to uh, this concept. But right now, we have realized that this is the future, and this is the way to go. And we have to embrace green transformation. Green transformation is crucial for the sustainable development. So we as entrepreneurs, and we have to uh, translate this idea into reality. So uh, through Ms. Chai, uh, we know that the Quanzhou city is also paying attention to the uh, green development of the enterprises. And that is why uh, the government is in, uh, inviting an expert on uh, carbon neutrality to the enterprises to give lectures. My last topic, I want to talk to Mr. Fu and Mr. Zheng. And because you are an enterprise, you have a huge market share globally. And right now, the international situation is changing dramatically. And China is now having this uh, dual circulation strategy. Uh, sometimes we say that we have opportunities of engaging in greater cooperation with the outside world. But right now, we are seeing we cannot put all the eggs in one basket. Uh, the drastic changes of international situation has been going on for quite a number of years. Uh, as a foreign trade oriented enterprise, and what coping measures do you have? I sit down quite often with other entrepreneur friends. Doing international trade actually hinges upon your core technology. Do you have the research and academia and high quality products? We have to focus on the core of the technology. And if you are good at research, don't do production. If you are good at production, don't do too much uh, marketing and uh, sales. So we have been doing transducers for quite a number of years. And traditionally, one set is uh, 28,000 yuan. But, one, but today, one production line is sold at 28 million yuan. So that is why we are doing training centers. We, we uh, present a lot of trainings. And sometimes uh, the trainings are organized by the government. I believe we are doing this in the right way. And we have to focus on a clear division of labor. And if you are from the research department, just do research. And if you are working on a production department, just focus on manufacturing. And we have 10 representative offices globally. And we transformed those representative offices into plants by working together with a local company. 
and during the pandemic, it has become more difficult. Over the past two years, travel has been restricted, and I encourage a lot of my people to go out. So why I do this uh, enterprise? Because the twenty some years ago, I went to an exhibition, and I was fascinated by the transducers, and then I started doing this business. Uh, ever since then, I told myself that I will become a strong competitor in the world, and I um, I won a competition with the uh, Korean and Japanese uh, company doing transducers because I could deliver better quality products with cheaper price. And they're not selling good products yet at a higher price. Uh, how is that possible? So, and that is why I won a competition. But right now, I'm shouldering more corporate social responsibilities. I'm thinking the issue in a more uh, in a higher level. I don't simply aim at winning. Competitions. Raw materials are uh, sold at a very high price these days. Uh, natural sand, uh, water, and different minerals. So right now we have to think about environmental protection. So a lot of my employees then they don't like to go global to uh, manage our 10 representative companies uh, in the world and they are worried about getting infected with covid-19 and i told them we have over 1000 employees globally in in all parts of the world and no matter it is the company in germany or austria and india and they need you if do you don't travel overseas, we're going to lose the competition. Uh, eventually, we're going to take, um, take the blow. I told them that there are a lot of people each year dying from drinking alcohol, but we're still drinking alcohol, and there is the risk in whatever we do. And if you don't dare to take risks, There won't be any future for our business. Uh, if you don't dare to travel overseas for our business there, then quit the job. It has been two years. Uh, how can we sustain as the business if we don't manage our overseas company? So I successfully mobilized our enterprises to go out because there is the risk no matter where you go and no matter what you do. So shipping is also very important and we work together with a lot of shipping companies and we talk to them face by face, face to face. I mean my 60s, and I believe that it is very important to sustain the spirit of uh, entrepreneurs. So, Bing Dun Dun and Shai Zhong Zhong, and they are sold very well globally. So, how do you balance domestic and international trade? And I believe you have a lot of uh, opportunities doing international trade. So we have to seek development out of steady growth. Uh, when we go to a country that has the geopolitical tension with China, we have to be very careful. 
we are looking at the changing uh, landscape of the world as a whole. And then we take a deeper look at our business, and wherever business is possible, we are very bold with our business. And there's a lot of uh, support from the government, and we have to be bold, and we have to believe in ourselves. And when we deal with the U.S. companies, we, we could sign contracts and we can have all those uh, fancy and nice words, but they could immediately walk away when there is a problem. So they can simply break the contract. And they don't take up their own responsibilities. So, so there are all types of risks. So we have to adjust our domestic production. In the meantime, we have to keep our eyes wide open for those uh, changing landscapes overseas, in particular, the changing situation in the market. So thank you very much, Mr. Zheng. And there are a lot of opportunities, and we have a huge potential in terms of uh, sales revenue. And consumption will continue driving our economy forward. Now we still have a couple of minutes. And uh, Mr. Liu, can you give us a brief uh, wrap up? Do you have some final words or suggestions to our entrepreneurs? Well, I believe I have benefited a lot from your sharings, and you guys are working at the front line. And some of you have a market share that is number one in the world. The government has to play a role in promoting international trade uh, in terms of the Jinjiang experience. And President Xi said it very well. Uh, he said that we have to uh, strike the balance in the relationship between governments and enterprises. And the government has to play a leading role. And we can allow our enterprises to go on their own, but the role of the government is indispensable, for example, in terms of public service. The government has to play a constructive role. And right now, we're talking about the full industrial chain innovation and also the uh, breakthroughs in application scenarios. And the government has to provide uh, platforms so as to drive uh, continuous uh, innovation. And there are some national programs initiated at Quanzhou, and this is very encouraging. You all talked about product and technology, and some of you have a market share that is quite astonishing globally, and this is truly encouraging. My suggestion to you is not to keep your head low. And we used to keep a very low profile in the past, but we are already doing very well, and we need to be bold in terms of marketing, and we have to allow branding to play a greater role in boosting our business because we're not generating or providing fake products or substandard products. We are providing the best products in the world. So why not speak it out loud? As Mr. Zheng has mentioned, he is doing um, a lot of innovations, for example, with uh, good materials and good designs of uh, Bing Jun Jun, and there is a lot of Chinese culture in it. So this is how culture can empower our business, and there is a lot of potential we can tap in culture. And the Chinese brands have to go global. Chinese technology and service and management philosophy must also go global. So. If we can go global with all those uh, different uh, categories and elements, we can truly achieve and realize high quality development. And this will be good for the whole industry as well as the whole country. 
and Chenzhou in general should sort out this level of uh, social responsibility. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Liu. And uh, as you have uh, two minutes, last but not least, let me give you one more task. Use one sentence to tell the global audience, so what is the entrepreneurship of Chenzhou? Let's start from uh, Mr. Huang and Ms. Tsai. One sentence. Mr. Huang, can you start? Well, I don't have an answer right now, but I believe be bold and then you will win. And next time we're going to translate that into English and translate that song into English and then sing it out. Ms. Tsai? Just focus and be pragmatic. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Tsai. And uh, Mr. Zhang, microphone, please. With integrity, we can win the world. We are sharing the same dream and together for the future. So focus, be determined, and be bold, and be professional. All right, integrity to win the world and be bold so you can win, and then uh, be focused and be pragmatic. All right, those are your answers interpreting and explaining the entrepreneurship in Quanzhou. Uh, thank you also very much to you, Mr. Liu, for your uh, wonderful um, presentation. Uh, you have uh, shared some insightful suggestions. And thank you all to our audience for participating in this event of the Rising Star series. All right, let's hope we can write more successful stories and stay tuned to our program of the Rising Star series. We're going to travel to more stories to decode their success secret. Thank you all. See you next time.